What's up you guys? Welcome back to my channel. I am so excited to be bringing this video to you guys today. I've been covering a lot of very heavy, disturbing and traumatic cases over the past couple of months. Um, I usually try to lighten things up in between, but I apparently decided to tackle all like the gigantic insane cases. Um, and I feel like we all kind of need a breather. I've seen a lot of you guys asking me to do a solve video um, and for something not as intense. So here I am to deliver that to you guys today. I've wanted to cover this story for a long time simply because it's absolutely wild. And I'm a huge fan of genealogy and all the work that CeCe Moore and the different genealogists are doing when it comes to solving crimes and just solving um, you know, these different questions about, you know, people's identity in general. Um, and so when I saw this story and then heard how crazy the twists and turns were, I just knew it was perfect for you guys. Let's go ahead and jump right in. So Chester and Dora Franzak, I believe Dora was 28 years old at the time. I am unsure how old Chester was, but they were a married couple living in Chicago, Illinois, and they were struggling to have a child. This was something that was very important to them. They couldn't wait to be parents, uh, but unfortunately, Unfortunately, in either 1962 or 1963, they suffered from a stillbirth and that was absolutely devastating. But shortly after the stillbirth, they found out that they were going to have a little boy by the following year, 1964, and his due date was somewhere in April. And they were so excited about this. Um, I can only imagine the conflicting emotions that they dealt with. I'm sure this was a very, you know, serious pregnancy for both of them. And it's something that they didn't take for granted. And, you know, they were probably excited, but also terrified. So it was a huge moment on April 26th in 1964 when Dora went into labor. They showed up to the Michael Reese Hospital and shortly after starting labor, they gave birth to Paul Franzak, a beautiful baby boy. He had the thickest, darkest hair and these big dark eyes and he had like the most serious facial expression from his baby picture and they were head over heels. Chester unfortunately had to go back to work. Um, so it was just Dora and Paul in the hospital for that first day and she was just soaking up every second of it. She was cuddling him and nursing him and experiencing all the things that she did not get to experience the first time that she had a child. Within a day, every parent's worst nightmare became the Franzak's reality. A nurse dressed in all white walked into Dora Franzak's room and said that she needed to take Paul to the nursery because the doctor needed to do a couple of examinations to make sure everything was okay, to figure out when they'd be able to be released from the hospital, all those things. So she grabbed Paul from Dora and headed out of the room. Now, obviously, if you've given birth before, this isn't anything abnormal. Um, I know I typically would ask them to do any testing they could in the room um, just because I'm an absolute nut, but, but uh, uh, at this point in time, most parents usually, you know, even sent their children to the nursery to recover and they would only bring the babies back for feeding. It was a very common thing. So it's not like there was any reason for alarm when this nurse took Paul, but unfortunately there was actually something very wrong with the situation. Now, Paul did not come back to the room for a while. And typically you nurse like every two to three hours when your baby is a newborn and it was becoming alarming. So Dora and the nurses all started to try to figure out, you know, wh where on earth is Paul? What is going on? But it didn't take long for the nurses to realize whoever took Paul was not actually one of them. No one recognized the woman that Dora was describing. Nobody could find Paul in the nursery and none of the doctors claimed to have examined him. So this immediately became an emergency. Nurses and doctors both frantically began to search the hospital waiting for police to arrive and Paul was nowhere to be found. A few witnesses ended up coming forward stating that they saw a woman who was dressed in white like a nurse leave with a baby outside of the hospital. She apparently fled pretty quickly, hopped into a taxi and drove off. So at this point, Paul had been abducted by a imposter nurse and taken away from the hospital. Chester was called out of work to come and obviously deal with the situation and also take care of Dora because she was hysterical. You guys, I cannot imagine just that situation happening in general, but for that to also happen after you've lost your other child due to a stillbirth, 
she was hysterical. She it was to the point where she actually had to be sedated for her own safety and well-being. It was very very bad and my heart aches for her. Authorities got in contact with the taxi company as quick as they could to figure out where on earth this woman was dropped off, and they were able to find that she was dropped off on the southwest side of Chicago in a neighborhood that direction. I've not seen the exact neighborhood, um, but because of this, they decided to send 200 officers out to this location. A picture of Paul, there was only one, I believe, from like right after he was born. It was given to all of the officers, as well as a sketch that was made up of the woman that took Paul, that was given to them by the witnesses. And these officers had to go door to door and ask anyone, you know, have you seen this woman? Have you seen this baby? Did you see, you know, a woman with a baby run by here? Did you see her get out of a taxi? They were trying to figure out, you know, what exactly was going on, see if anyone in the neighborhood knew her. By midnight, they had searched well over 600 houses. So they weren't just knocking on the door, hey, have you seen this? They physically went inside and searched these houses because obviously this woman would not want to be found. There was a huge chance that she was hiding. But unfortunately, despite all those homes being searched, they came back empty handed. Now keep in mind, Paul was a newborn. There's really not much they know about this baby. He was only a day old. His parents had only spent a day with him. They're still learning him. Um, he didn't have any birthmarks, I believe, nothing to really stand him out from any other baby. Um, and also babies change so fast. Um, there's a lot of like bruising that can happen and swelling and the head usually changes shape a little bit. Um, so even after just a few hours or a few days or even weeks, it can look like an entirely different child. And also DNA testing was not a thing. So all they had was Paul's blood type and his ear shape, which was a commonly used uh, identification technique. And those are the two things that they were relying on. This picture of Paul from literally right after he was born, hoping he didn't change too much. His ears, his blood type, which I mean, there's only so many blood types you can be. And that's pretty much it. Despite being the largest manhunt in Chicago at the time, it wasn't really going anywhere. Authorities were not getting any leads, no information leading them towards Paul. So they enlisted the help of 175,000 mail carriers from all over the United States. They figured, you know, who's out there going house to house daily, someone that delivers mail. So they sent out photos of Paul again, as well as the sketch of this woman to those 175,000 mail carriers and said, look, while you're taking your routes, while you're delivering the mail, see if any of these people fit this description, um, you know, and let us know if you see anything odd, let us know if a family suddenly has a baby and you like didn't see them pregnant or anything like that, let us know about that. You know, if it's unexplainable, they were trying everything they could to locate Paul. Chester in a state of grief and this destroyed me when I read it he was so upset and so desperate and all he wanted was that whoever took Paul at least to take care of them until they could find them so he reached out to different newspapers and had them put something within their publication that taught people how to mix formula, like make formula and how often to feed babies based on how old they are and all of that because he just wanted to make sure and hope that like in, that whoever took him would read it and be like, okay, I know how to properly take care of this child. Meanwhile, the search for Paul continued. At this point and pretty much from the get-go, the FBI was involved as well as local police and many other police departments. There were orphanages that had been contacted, human services across the board had been contacted just in case Paul ended up in any of their hands. By 1966, around two years later, over 10,000 babies had been examined to see if they could possibly be Paul. This is babies that were, you know, either unexplainably brought into the doctor or maybe ended up abandoned, that were brought into orphanages, um, anything like that. They were all examined to see if they were Paul, but none of them seemed to be a match. But again, keep in mind, they didn't have much to go on. He would look entirely different at this point. Yes, his ear shape may remain the same, I will say that, but it was just 
this was a tedious process. It's not like today where we can be like, oh, DNA test, and that'll give us an answer, like immediate yes or no. Then all of a sudden something huge happened. It was later in 1966, I believe around July, there was a little boy that was found abandoned in Newark, New Jersey. He was found probably around two years old is what they estimated, and he was just strapped into a stroller outside of a department store on Cedar Street in Newark, just left there in a stroller. And obviously he was picked up by authorities, he was taken to the hospital to be checked out, and then he was put into an orphanage where he was renamed Scott McKinley and then put into the foster system. So. At this point, nothing had been connected um, and he ended up with a family that baptized him and they were planning, uh, you know, to consider adopting him and everything. But all of a sudden, Newark police are like, hmm, I wonder if this little boy, because the age kind of seems right, I wonder if this is actually Paul. New Jersey police ended up contacting the FBI who looked at the pictures and I even have them up right here in front of me. The picture that they saw of this little boy and then the picture of Paul when he was a baby and I can completely see it. I mean, the hair looks like it could be the same. The eyebrow shape appears like it could be the same. The eyes, the nose even, there's something about the lips that are similar. The ears, I mean, I can kind of see it. But the FBI said, you know, the ears look similar enough, this could be a thing. Like there could be a chance that this is actually actually Paul. So they went ahead and contacted the Fronzaks. Now, the Fronzaks were beside themselves because I'm sure at this point they aren't ever sure if their son is coming home or ever going to be found and 10,000 other children have been tested. Um, I don't know if this was the first time that they'd been told, you know, you need to come look at this kid. Um, so I'm sure this was a lot for them, but they decided they were going to go ahead and head to New Jersey, see this little boy, see what they thought. Um, and kind of go from there. According to people that were around the Fronzacs when they saw this little boy, one of the first things that Dora said was, this is him, this is my Paul. Um, you know, again, I can totally see it, but it was difficult because, just, you know, he ended up somehow going from Chicago to New Jersey, which isn't totally out of the question, um, but just the chances of him getting that far or someone traveling that far afterwards or traveling that far to take a baby, just, it's not super likely. I feel like now it's a lot easier to do that, but back then, probably not as much. Um, and also, you know, there's no way to DNA test. They're really just relying on the hope and the thought that this could possibly be him. There was really no other evidence indicating this little boy was their son. But despite this, they decided, you know what, this, this has to be him. We're pretty sure it's him. We're going to adopt him and take him back to Chicago. And that is exactly what they did. Fronzax were thrilled to have Paul back home. They changed his name back to Paul Fronzak. And they also had another boy. I don't know if they had another son between this time span or after they got Paul back. Um, but he had a brother now and their family felt complete. They felt like this nightmare that they'd been living through for two years was finally over. But Paul from a very early age kind of felt like something was off. So first of all, he realized that just in general, he was very different from his family. He had very, very different interests. And while that's not odd, that's not any indicating factor that you are not biologically related to your parents. So none of y'all don't freak out and be like, oh my gosh, well, they don't like sports. Clearly I'm not their child. Um, don't go there. But it just felt like extremes. Like he was very active and social and into loud music and long hair and like this crazy lifestyle. And the Fronzacs were very, very reserved. They uh, were Catholic, went to the church, you know, Catholic schooling. He just felt, you know, just like the odd man out at all times. And on top of that, his brother looked exactly like Chester, like to a T. I'll have up a picture so you can see, but he looked nothing like them. And like, not just like a little bit, he looked nothing like either of his parents. But those thoughts became a serious reality by the time he was 10 years old. Paul was on a mission, like most kids that age, to find out where his parents had hidden his Christmas presents. I've done it before, I get it. And he was like, you know what? I'm going to go and search in this crawl space that's hidden behind the sofa, like the couch. The couch is pushed up against the wall so none of the kids can get in the crawl space, do something crazy, get themselves trapped. 
And so he moved the couch away and he went to look in there to check to see if his Christmas presents were in there. But instead, upon crawling in, he was faced with three large boxes. And those boxes were filled with photos, newspaper clippings, and cards from strangers and family members offering sympathy to Dora and Chester. And he's like, what on earth is this? And he starts to read it and look, and he realizes that it's all about him. Now, at this point, they had chosen to not tell Paul about what happened to him as a baby. The fact that he had been abducted from the hospital, that it took two years for them to find him, that he had been abandoned on the side of a street in New Jersey. Um, so this is his first time learning any of this information, and it's three boxes filled. I mean, it's two years worth of you know, information that he is all of a sudden taking in at 10 years old. So he gathers a few of these items and immediately runs to his parents and is like, what on earth is this? I didn't know about this. What's going on? Am I your child? Like freaking out. And they're like, you know, all you need to know is that we have you back now. We love you. You are our son. That is all that you need to know. So at this point, they kind of just pushed it back, brushed it away and wanted to move on with life. Paul went on to attend Catholic high school. He still had, you know, this quirky personality that was a little bit different from his family. He had a huge interest in music, particularly rock. He loved having his hair long. He loved edgy outfits. Um, and it just still made him feel like there was just something different about him and his family. And when I say this, I don't want anyone to think he had a bad life or that his family treated him as an outcast because he's made it very clear he was so loved. He was so well taken care of. He wouldn't have had his life any other way. Everything was perfect. He loved his parents. Um, but he just noticed these small things that just made him feel like he was being left out. Nobody made him feel left out. He just noticed these small things. Um, but anyways, after high school, he left and he decided to move away and he joined a rock band for a little while. And then he went in the army and then he was a model and then he was an actor and then he was a salesman. It seemed like he was trying to fit, you know, it seemed like he was trying to figure out why he felt like this hole inside of him, why he felt like something was off. So he tried all these different things and just none of it was really doing it. And through all these moves and all these changes, he always had the newspaper clippings with him. And there was always this possibility in the back of his mind that maybe I am not the Franzak's missing son. So one day in 2012 or 2013, I've seen it both dates, when his parents were visiting him, he ended up in Las Vegas. He said, look, I've got all these questions. I've got all these concerns. I feel like something could be off. Um, I just happened to see the other day that there are these at home DNA test kits that you can do. Um, you can literally buy these things at Target now or like Walmart. And he was like, you know, sh we should test. We should test to make sure that I am in fact, you know, Paul, the Paul that was taken from you in the hospital. And I think it took, at least from what it seems, it took some convincing. I guess uh, Dora and... Chester said that they had had their doubts before. So they even confirmed, you know, we had moments where we weren't really sure. Um, but ultimately, they all decided to swab and send in the DNA. Now, shortly after this, they boarded a plane and left back to Chicago. And in those few hours, they had decided they changed their mind. So once they landed in Chicago, they, you know, talked to Paul and they're like, look, we've changed our mind regardless of DNA or whatever. We have raised you. You are our son we are your parents, like it doesn't matter. We don't want you to do this because all this is gonna do is cause you know pain and all of this for everyone. But Paul realized that he had spent majority of his life questioning things and he, for himself and for his own sanity and peace of mind, he needed to do it. So after a few weeks of you know keeping the tests in his desk, and thinking about it, he finally decided to send the tests in. Then he got a call confirming what he had always believed. He was not the Franzak's biological son. Before reaching out to Dora and Chester to let them know the results of this test that he had originally told them that he would not send in, uh, he decided to speak with an investigative journalist because he was faced with two huge things. First of all, he had no idea who he was, no clue. An investigation had never really been done on it because he was pretty quickly deemed to be Paul, the missing Paul. Um, and also 
where on earth was Paul? Like the real one. And this is going to get confusing from here on out because there's like a million different Pauls, it feels like at this point. Um, but he wanted to figure out who he was and figure out where the biological Paul actually went and what happened to him. Is he still out there? Um, and he thought this investigative journalist would be able to help him because after all, the power of spreading information on social media is wild. We speak about it all the time. Then he broke the news to Chester and Dora. And they were devastated, obviously, because they did not want him to do the test. They felt betrayed because he went to the investigative journalist first without, you know, first speaking to them. And they already had huge issues with the media before because the media kind of didn't give them a lot of space when they left the hospital. Um, they were in the hospital for a week and then they left empty handed. And that was the second time they had to do that. This was heartbreaking for them. And the media just was relentless, just hogging them on their way home. They're trying to grieve and understand what's happening and wrap their minds around this. And the media did not give them a chance to breathe. So it felt like they were reliving this nightmare all over again. Like it was just all coming back to haunt them and it was very upsetting. So they were mad at Paul. They were very upset with him. And I'm sure it was also a whole other thing to realize it really wasn't their Paul. For 47 years, it was not their Paul and they still didn't know what actually happened to him. And I can't imagine having to swallow that um, along with everything else that they're now finding out. So they ended up actually not speaking to him for a little over a year, but this did not stop what Paul was doing. He was still on you know, a search for his identity and for the real Paul. In July of 2015, he reached out to the I team in Las Vegas for help. They covered his story and he did a few interviews hoping to gather some sort of information, put him in contact with people. Maybe someone would hear his story and, you know, remember him or who he was. And he ended up immediately getting hundreds and hundreds of tips across the website and the Facebook page that was dedicated to him thanks to the I team. And it seemed like it wasn't really beneficial at first, but it ended up getting the attention of Cece Moore. Now I've spoken about Cece Moore before. She does a lot of incredible work. She is a genetic genealogist and um, she basically created what she's doing. Like the method she uses to create this family tree and kind of work backwards. And it's incredible what she does. And she offered uh, for her team to help Paul, I believe for free, figure out who he actually was. They spent endless hours tracking down family trees. So essentially what they do is like they get all of his DNA, genetic makeup the best that they can, and then they try to match that to anyone close. And then they create these family trees and then they, you know, base it off of location. It's just an incredible process. If you look up interviews with Cece Moore, she describes it a lot better than I just did. Um, but they basically created multiple family trees, multiple different possibilities of families, and they were also donated genetic test kits to be able to rule these people out. Now, they ended up finally finding a really positive lead and it took them to the east coast where paul had been found abandoned but not to new jersey where he had been found but to tennessee and through genetic testing they were able to find that they had in fact finally found paul's real family and paul obviously was not paul he was actually jack rosenthal and he was born on october 27th not in april like he had known his entire life um, again in tennessee now the Paul that didn't know his identity ended up being called Scott McKinley and then was taken from there to or from there to Chicago where he was then claimed to be missing Paul Franzak, lived his whole life that way, now finds out that he's not either of those and he's actually this Jack Rosenthal. So he's like, who is my family? Like how old, you know, how old am I actually? Like what is going on? Why was I abandoned? And he found out that he was one of five children. One had passed away. Both of his parents had passed away by the time he found this information out as well. And there were two siblings that remained. Now, obviously that does not add up to five and I'm not just terrible at math. I mean, I'm bad at math. I will say that, but not in this case. The one remaining person ended up flipping the story into an even crazier whirlwind. Jack had a twin sister named Jill. And I'm not making this up. <laughs> I promise I am not making this up. This is a real thing. Jack had a twin sister named Jill and Jill was 
missing. So both Jack and Jill had likely been abandoned or something happened and she has still not been found. So they started to question the remaining family members to figure out what on earth happened, how these twins went missing. There was no indication that a missing persons report had ever been put out. They found out the very scary dark truth about Paul's past. And I will say, I'm going to continue calling Paul, Paul, even though his real name is Jack because he never changed his name to Jack. He kept Paul Franzak. I know this is very confusing, but try to hang in there with me. Um, but they found out that Jack and his sister Jill um, had likely gone missing right around their second birthday. So he was right around two when he was found when those pictures were taken. Now there are in fact birth certificates to prove Jack and Jill both existed obviously, um, but there's no death certificate for Jill. There doesn't seem to be any record that a young girl around the same time was found in any other neighboring state. So they pretty much know absolutely nothing about Jill um, and are still, well, at least Paul is still looking for her to this day and he speaks about it on his blog. Um, but anyways, so according to family members, the twins were badly neglected. Some cousins said that the twins would be kept in cages. Um, According to family as well, no one questioned when they went missing because no one knew that they were missing because they never brought the twins around anywhere. So I'm assuming likely any time the family left the house or went to see family or anything that they were kept in these cages or something. Um, but basically they would say, oh no, someone on the other side of the family is watching them right now. And like they would play this game back and forth on either side so nobody really questioned anything about the twins. When anyone in the family would mention the twins after it's believed they disappeared, they remembered that the father would shut that conversation down immediately and basically warn and threaten everyone to stop talking about the twins, saying, you know, they didn't exist and all of that. And uh, their grandparents actually even kept a photo, like a chronological photo book um, and every page you know had something about a different child or person in the family and there was a page for the twins but when someone looked for it it had been torn out of the book so basically these twins it seemed like they tried to erase them from existence basically now unfortunately Paul believes that Jill had a much worse fate than he did because they were trying to understand why on earth you know Jack would have been abandoned somewhere so far away from Jill, you know, there's no evidence of her being anywhere. So he honestly wonders if maybe something happened to her because of the neglect. And so in order for no one to question anything more, they just decided to get rid of him as well. That's just his theory as far as I have seen it. It's crazy. It's a crazy story. It's so heartbreaking. Um, and again, Paul decided to not go by the name of Jack. It was the one thing that he didn't have to change if he didn't want to. So he decided to keep the name Paul. And despite this horrifying background, um, he got a chance to meet other family members and instantly felt like this is that hole that he had been missing. They were full of music and his cousin, I think, was in a doo-wop band in the 50s and they were able to sit down and play music together and they just, it felt like a glove. All these different things about Paul that he had wondered why they were so different from the Franzaks, it's because that was part of the Rosenthal in him. And even the genealogist said that things like this will never get old for them when it comes to reunions, when they get family members back in touch with family because people that have never even known the other existed, but they're still family. When they come together, they always can't believe how crazy similar they are. And it's just wild to see how things can run so deep. But while Paul, also known as Jack, was trying to figure out more about his past and who he was and where he came from, the real Paul still had not been found until possibly December of 2019, so about a year ago. Now, I wanna make it clear, the FBI, from what I have seen, has not confirmed any of this. Um, they have put out a statement that there's still an ongoing investigation and they are following certain leads, but that that was all they had for the public at the time. But apparently there is a man in Michigan and from what I know the story to be, um, his children essentially somehow heard about this and believed that their father was actually this missing Paul. I'm not sure what made them believe this. Um, and according to an investigative journalist who has been in contact with him, this investigative journalist says that his DNA matches that of 
Paul, the baby that was abducted from the hospital. Now, the FBI has not confirmed this. I have not seen law enforcement confirm this. The name of Paul that he's been going by um, all this time for 55 plus years, um, they've not released it. They are trying to keep his privacy and the FBI again has stated this is an ongoing investigation. Uh, and he apparently found out all of this information while battling cancer. Now, I've seen a lot of different mixed sources say different things on this. Some say that the FBI did, in fact, contact him about the potential that he was, in fact, the real um, Paul. But I've seen other ones state that it's really still up in the air. So it's kind of a confusing situation, and it's almost been a year at this point, and I've heard nothing more. I do know that this man has said he has a lot of loose ends to tie up, and he's trying to come to terms with this information. So it sounds, from what they're saying this man is stating, pretty legitimate. Like, he is, in fact, this Paul, but I have not seen anyone else address this as being fact. So um, just keep that out there. But I'm sure he has a lot that he is going through. If he is finding this out because um you know there's a huge chance he might have gone his entire life not knowing that he you know wasn't who he thought he was and um you know this woman that took him I'm not sure if that's who he believes his parents are or if he was handed off to somebody else um he seems to have had at least a decent upbringing he's got kids of his own so I have no idea where it stands at this point. I have seen them say he is unsure if he's going to meet his biological mother or not, Dora. At this point, he cannot meet Chester because Chester has since passed away and I'm sure that in itself is a whole other thing that he's having to wrestle with at the moment. Um, I can't imagine what any of these people are going through, honestly, because that is a lot. It is scary to think that this one woman's decision, you know, whether it was because she maybe like struggled with child loss or infertility or something you know she might have thought she was making an okay decision but ultimately it has led to a lot of really really bad struggles for a lot of people and it's an abduction an abduction is still an abduction no matter you know your justification for it um but it's just wild to see how this has unfolded and how crazy you know Paul also known as Jack to see like how his story is so insane tied into a story that's already so crazy. I mean, he was returned to the wrong family, <laughs> essentially. And then he finds out at almost 50 years old that it's because his family actually abandoned him and he had a twin sister and she's still missing. So he's on all these different hunts for his sister and for the real Paul. And he still really cares about his family and he loves his mom. And they've, you know, mended their relationship after she was upset with him for doing the DNA test. And he says that he loves her more than anything. On his blog, he just recently posted this big thing for Mother's Day about her and all the great things that she did for him. Um, you know, he said he's thankful that she made the decision that she did because what if he somehow ended up back in his parents' hands and didn't survive? Um, I know that he believes that his sister has been killed from the last that I've seen, that Jill was in fact killed by his parents. I've seen all sorts of information about them exhuming certain bodies in places. I've seen a few pictures, but I'm not sure how everything went. That was a whole other bit of information um, that you can actually look into if you were interested in reading the rest of Paul's story. But when it comes to the real Paul, I guess we'll just keep waiting for answers. It seems like this might be him, but again, nothing has been confirmed. But if so, that's absolutely crazy that all these years later, all of a sudden, all these answers just explode. And that to me is why genealogy is so dang important. And I know so many people were upset with Paul for his decision to go and get the DNA test to see if he was um, the biological son of Dora and Chester. But honestly, I believe he has every right to know the truth about himself. I think it's unfair to expect him to just accept it because others may, and that may come off harsh, but imagine if you were in his position. I honestly don't blame him at all, and I'm so thankful that people like CC Moore exist doing this type of research, conducting this kind of work in order to help people like that, because Paul says that he's been put in contact with dozens of people who've been in the same situation as him, and the fact that that's even a thing, that it's this common, is crazy, but there's apparently people coming all out of the place saying, oh yeah, you know, I was stolen from my parents as a baby in the hospital. They renamed me, hid me from everybody. And then I finally questioned things and figured out what was going on. And 
I mean, there's just all these people that claim that they were taken as babies and now all of a sudden they're all finding out, you know, what their real identity is. And I could not imagine that being the story of my life, going so many years thinking one thing was a reality um, when in fact there is a huge shift and something is way, and it's way different than I believed. So honestly, I think this is the best ending there could have been to this story because Paul ended up having an amazing life, even though he technically was Jack and not biologically Dora and Chester's child. Um, he still grew up with people that loved him and people that cared for him. And then he was able to then later be reunited with parts of his family from his past. He didn't know that they still care about him and they question what happened to him. And I think that's absolutely amazing. He wasn't left in the hands of parents that neglected him. And on top of that, Obviously, the real Paul, from what it looks like, he seemed to have an okay life despite the fact that he was taken away from his family and, um, you know, despite the fact that he's struggling with it, I still think it's great that he has some answers and that Dora was able to at least know that nothing bad happened to her child because, unfortunately, that is not the reality for so many people. So many people find out horrible things that have been done to their children and, um while it may not be ideal and maybe years and decades and decades later, um, just knowing that he is okay uh, is a huge deal to me. Again, if that is actually the real Paul, which I will hopefully be able to update you on whenever they release that information. But on that note, you guys, thank you so much for listening to today's story. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button to become a part of the Howlin' fam so that hopefully we can bring them home together and I will see you guys in my next video. Bye.